This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hello and welcome to Invisible Hate. I'm Asad Butt. And I'm Zadia Khan. And our story today takes us back to Denver, Colorado in June of 1984. Bruce Carroll Pierce jumps in the getaway car, slamming the door shut behind him. Inside, several others await his return. In Pierce's hands is a 45 caliber Mac-10 machine gun equipped with a silencer. The gun is 13 bullets lighter than it was just five minutes ago. Those bullets now belong to the body of radio talk show host Alan Berg. Getaway driver David Lane steps on the gas as the group drives away from the crime scene. Behind them, Berg lies on the sidewalk in a pool of blood, dying. So, who were these violent criminals? They call themselves The Order, and they have just successfully executed their first target. This is Invisible Hate. Welcome back to Invisible Hate, a weekly true crime podcast in which Sadia and I attempt to uncover the ugly truth behind various hate crimes, both recent and historical. That's right, Asad. Many of the cases that we discuss involve crimes committed against minority groups. Our goal is to determine through a discussion of the nuances and complexities of these unfortunate situations whether or not these transgressions can be considered hate crimes. Today, we will be returning to a case that we covered last week for part two of this crazy story. If you haven't listened to last week's episode yet, click pause, go back, listen to that episode first. I can give you a brief overview of what we discussed last week. The discussion was basically about the crime the victim, Alan Berg, the public response to his murder, and our group of perpetrators known as The Order. So I said, before we jump in, how was the week? <laughs> yeah, good week over here. Um, it started raining in Portland and fall has arrived. And as such, I'm listening to a lot more content and uh, while I'm cleaning the house or kind of doing some fall cleaning. Sadly, I had a question that I wanted to ask you, uh, get your hmm. thoughts, you know, as because we do, you know, this kind of true crime stuff. I came across a podcast series in which the entire series, I can't even think of the name. I'll have to go find it. But the whole series is just someone interviewing people that committed crimes from prison. And so, you know, they basically talk to murderers, rapists, you name it, and talk to them to hear their side of the story. And I wanted to get your thoughts on what you thought about that. That's an interesting question, Asad. I don't know what I think. I have many thoughts. On the one hand, I'm thinking, yeah, why not? They should get a platform to give their perspective. But on the other hand, why are we giving murderers, rapists a platform? Yeah to express their thoughts. Haven't they caused enough damage already? But to be honest, I'll have to do more research around the podcast, the mission, why and how this podcast came about to make a judgment call. But right off the bat, that's what I think. Yeah. So the reason I came across it, Sadia, I think you might know this and for our listeners, this might be new information. But earlier in my career, I worked at a television station and it turned out that a couple of years after I left the job, the founder of that television station ended up murdering his wife, and he is now mm. in prison for the rest of his life. And so this is someone that I worked with for about a year. You know, again, this was like 20 years ago. And so he was on this podcast kind of sharing oh, his was. perspective across two episodes. And so that's why I was listening to him trying to justify why he, why he committed murder, which is just really surreal as well a little bit. Mm. 
Did it change your mind about him? No, no, no not at all. Um, I, you know, he's a, in my head, a, a, a psychopath, manipulative psychopath. Um, so, yeah, the reason I asked you that question is because, yeah, it's 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 interesting that, you know, these perpetrators, especially when it comes to murder, they have a voice, but their victims obviously don't have that voice anymore. And so exactly. it is really weird for me to, to I actually stopped halfway through and I haven't listened to the second part yet, um, probably because I, you know, I was feeling a little bit queasy. Mm. So anyway. Mm. So I said talking about feeling queasy, do we get started on this week's episode, part two of yeah. Alan Berg's murder? Absolutely. So, Asad, can you tell us about the investigations surrounding Berg's murder? So, interestingly, the order was already under investigation by the FBI prior to Berg's murder. In the early 1980s, the FBI became particularly concerned by the abundance of white supremacist leaders attempting to lure and recruit followers. Their intention was to stage revolts against the U.S. government. Sounds really <laughs> familiar uh, to right now. As a result, according to CNN, the FBI sent Special Agent Wayne Manis into an area of northern Idaho. That region was known to be home to the racist religious group called the Aryan Nations. Manis had been working undercover for the Bureau since 1967 and had a wealth of experience investigating hate crimes such as the New Left in Chicago and the KKK in Alabama, so he was like the perfect man for the job. Given this experience, the FBI sent Manis undercover in an attempt to gain intel against the Aryan nations. In the process, however, Manis discovered another dangerous extremist group none other than the Order. Oh, wow. Yeah, while Manis was aware of the threat that the Order posed, there was a catch. Before the FBI could launch a full federal investigation in Idaho, they first had to prove to the U.S. Attorney General that the presence of the Order posed a substantial threat to the country. And so Manis got down to work gathering intelligence in order to prove this. He spent months on end sorting through records, attempting to draw connections between various known crimes, and he was finally able to pinpoint about five or six different crimes all carried out by the order. This list included counterfeiting, bank robbery, armored car robbery, and the bombing of a synagogue, which we talked about in the last episode. He originally thought, Sadia, that the network was about 30 to 40 people, but it actually turned out to be a lot larger later on. Wow, Asad. So that's a pretty sizable network, right? Was Manis finally able to gain the backing of the Department of Justice? And more importantly, where does Berg's death fit into all of this, Asad? Great question, Sadia. In many ways, Berg's death seemed to be the final nail in the coffin for the order. After Berg was discovered dead, it didn't take long for investigators to make the connection to the order. Um, and it was clear that they were dangerous. Manis finally had enough information to gain the full support of the Department of Justice. And in July, the department authorized the FBI to do a full-scale security investigation on the order. In response, the Bureau sent a large team of agents into Idaho to help Manis locate the leader, Robert Matthews, and other members of the group. According to CNN, the agents tracked down the phone calls made by the suspects, traced the motels they stayed in, and tracked the vehicles that they drove. They even placed an undercover agent inside of the neo-Nazi group. What's really interesting, Sadia, is one of the most useful sources of intel for the FBI was actually that fictional novel we talked about in the last episode. Oh, no, the novel makes an appearance again. <laughs> again, yeah, it's back. As you might remember from the last episode, the leader of the order, Robert Matthews, used a fictional novel entitled The Turner Diaries as inspiration for the order, and he used that story in the book as a guide to the group's actions. So The Turner Diaries was written by a neo-Nazi leader called William Luther Pierce. The novel depicts the violent overthrow of the U.S. government by white extremists and the extermination of all non-white enemies. While this was surely alarming, the discovery of the Turner Diaries proved to be quite beneficial to the FBI. 
the Bureau was able to use the plot of the story in order to predict and track Matthew's movements. Oh my gosh, I said, there's something so ironic about the fact that Matthew's source of inspiration ends up contributing to his downfall. Yeah. And what really surprises me is how stupid was Matthew <laughs> to follow every single thing in the novel. Yeah, exactly. Be a little yeah. creative, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly right. I like that, Sadia. We are going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll be continuing our discussion of the investigation of Allen Berg's murder and the general investigation surrounding the order. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Welcome back to Invisible Heat. So Asit, what happened next? How did the FBI ultimately locate the group? Yeah, so according to Rolling Stone, on October 18th, 1984, just four months after Berg's death, FBI agents were surveilling the house of Gary Lee Yardborough in Sandpoint, Idaho, when suddenly they were shot at. Yardborough was a suspected member of the Aryan Nations and therefore a point of interest in the FBI's investigation. In response to this show of aggression, the agents actually decided to enter the house and Yarborough fled immediately. However, what the agents found inside the home was critical to the investigation. Mm. Get this, Sadia. In the room on the second floor, the FBI found a three-foot-high portrait of Adolf Hitler surrounded by candles. Oh, my <laughs> Yeah, you know, like a shrine, basically. It's so messed up, I said, and tacky. <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly, I would agree. Also in the house, they found a range of guns and explosives and crossbows and all sorts of other weapons, just like a big cache of this kind of stuff. The FBI later positively identified one of those weapons as the MAC-10 machine pistol that was Berg's murder weapon. So they were getting closer to solving the case. Yardborough, the guy that they were monitoring, he was captured a few weeks later in a motel in Portland, Oregon. Portland again, I said. Portland again, after a shootout with the FBI. So sadly, the FBI still couldn't find Robert Matthews, who was Yardborough's partner. But through various sources of intel, they were able to figure out where Matthews and six other members of the order were. And they ended up being at a hideout on Puget Sound in Washington. And so in December of 1984, a group of agents closed in on that hideout. And as soon as the group moved in, though, Matthew started shooting. Here's FBI agent Wayne Manis talking to nonprofit news organization Retro Report. Bob refused, refused to surrender. We were met with gunfire. I took about seven rounds just over my head. Yeah, so Sadia, after a 36-hour standoff, a flare ignited the cabin and the house immediately burst into flames. Matthews remained trapped in the home, blasting the burning walls with gunfire as the house collapsed in on him. According to CNN, at daybreak, the agents entered the home to find Matthews' burnt body buried amongst the rubble. So while Matthews had died in the fire, six other members were arrested at the scene. They all survived. And actually, according to sources, by March of that year, more than 15 members of various Aryan groups had been caught. And this included all four of Berg's alleged murderers. In an interview with the Retro Report, former FBI agent Thomas McDaniel stresses the importance of these arrests. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that had we not stopped him, there would have been a federal building that had been blown up. These guys were for real. Wow, I said, this is just absurd. Thank God the FBI was able to stop the terrorist group before they did something even worse, right? 
Yeah. We are going to take another quick break, but when we return, we'll be discussing the trials following Berg's murder. Welcome back to Invisible Heat. So, Asad, we just spent all this time talking about the capture of Berg's murderers. Can you tell us about the trials following their capture? Yeah, absolutely, Sadia. So, remember, there are four primary defendants that were brought to trial for the murder of Allen Berg. The first was Bruce Carroll Pierce, who was the alleged triggerman. The second was David Lane, who was the suspected getaway driver. The third was Jean Margaret Craig, who was the one that was gathering all that intel. And the fourth one was a person named Richard Scutari, who was just a suspected contributor. Scutari's role in the murder was never really clearly defined in the trial, but the prosecution really thought that he was involved in the crime in some way, shape, or form. It was also believed that Robert Matthews was involved in the crime, Sadia, but he couldn't be tried because he had died in December in that fire that we talked about. As for Yardborough, for some reason, he wasn't tried for the murder of Berg. Oh, wow. Yeah, however, he was tried and convicted for illegal weapons possession for which he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Going back to the four primary defendants, in 1987, the four of them were tried jointly in federal district court. The prosecutors sought to argue that the four had deprived Berg of his civil rights. Under federal law, this must include not only the act of murder, but the intent to kill Berg because of his Jewish religion and the fact that the murder prevented his exercise of free speech, a right that Berg exercised often because of his job as a radio host. So, Sadia, this comes from law, Title 18 of the U.S. Code, Section 245. This section essentially states that whoever attempts to injure or intimidate any person because of their race, color, religion, or national origin, and because they are, quote, enjoying employment by a private employer, shall be fined or in prison. Hmm. In other words, the prosecution sought to prove that these members of the order killed Berg both because he was Jewish and because of his job as a talk show host. Defense attorneys sought to fight back against these claims by arguing that Berg was not technically a practicing Jew, making this aspect of his identity irrelevant to the crime. Prosecutors, however, countered that regardless of Berg's status as a, quote, practicing Jew, the defendants had used their perception of him as Jewish as the primary motive for their crime. I said, I totally agree with the prosecutors here because at the end of the day, it's not just about real identity or whether somebody is practicing or not. It's about the perception of it as well, right? So this makes a lot of sense to me. But there's one thing that I am confused about. It seems there were no eyewitnesses present at Berg's murder and very little tangible evidence evidence of the defendant's involvement in the crime. So how did prosecutors attempt to prove that these men had killed Berg? Yeah, that's a great question, Sadia. The prosecution relied heavily upon the testimonies of other imprisoned members of the order. These members agreed to testify and share their information in exchange for reduced sentences. And let me tell you, Sadia, these testimonies were pretty damning. According to court documents in his testimony, a man by the name of Randall Rader claimed that just four days before Berg was killed, Rader had a conversation with alleged getaway driver David Lane at Robert Matthews' property in Washington. Lane had told Rader that a talk show host in Denver was going to be killed because he had humiliated a KKK member on the radio. Sounds hmm. familiar, right? In another testimony, a man named David Parmenter told the jury that in September of 1984, just a few months after Berg's death, alleged triggerman Bruce Pierce had proudly claimed that, quote, when Alan Berg was shot, he dropped as if a carpet had been pulled out from under him, end quote. Pierce had boasted about his crime to several other individuals, including a person named Kenneth Loff. To Loff, Pierce admitted that he killed Berg with a Mac-10 machine gun. 
And these are just three examples, Sadia, of the testimonies given, but the list goes on and on. It's pretty damning stuff. Absolutely, Asad. It seems as if these men were basically backed into a corner. Finally. Yeah, definitely right. Yeah. In addition to these testimonies, the government also introduced additional evidence. On the nights of June 16th, 17th, and 18th, Pierce had reserved a room at a Denver motel. And if you recall, Berg was killed on June 18th. Right. So Pierce was there those three nights. Even more damning, the government's ballistics expert was able to connect the shells and bullets found at the crime scene with others found in Pierce's home. And as you may have guessed, ultimately, both the testimonies and the additional evidence proved largely successful, and both Bruce Pierce and David Lane were convicted with civil rights violations in the murder of Alan Burke. Pierce was sentenced to 252 years in prison, in federal prison, while Lane was sentenced to 150 years in federal prison. So both Scutari and Craig, on the other hand, were acquitted of the charges, but Scutari was actually sentenced to 60 years on separate racketeering charges for other crimes that he committed while part of the order. So, you know, Sadie, even though he was acquitted of these particular charges, Scutari was sentenced to 60 years on separate federal racketeering charges for other order related crimes. And then for those of you that don't know, racketeering refers to committing a specific list of crimes such as bribery, fraud, gambling offenses, money laundering, murder for hire, and so much more. These crimes are planned and executed for the sake of extracting illegal profits for a business or a group. In other words, Scutari was charged with committing several order-related crimes. Wow, I said that's so messed up. But I'm glad Pierce and Lane were charged and sentenced for this horrific, horrific crime. Given all that, should we get to our primary question of the episode? Should Allen Berg's murder be considered a hate crime? Yeah, I mean, Sally, I think there's a lot to go over here. And I think it's, for me, I think it's a pretty easy case to make. I mean... It appears that it's a hate crime, right? He was targeted because he was Jewish. He was targeted because he was very vocal about his opposition to hate groups and the KKK and for what he did on air. And yeah, I think that his Jewish identity was pretty central to who he was, even though he was not practicing, but he was perceived to be Jewish. And so that's how these groups viewed him. And he was on the hit list because of that. So that's kind of how I see it. How do you see it? You're absolutely right, Asad. The order basically placed him on a hit list because of his Jewish identity and also because of his liberal views, which were as a result of how white supremacists were criticizing and showing or expressing their anti-Semitic racist views. So he was basically responding to that. Yeah. Now, Asad, I do want our listeners to think through two complicating factors in this case, right? First, even though Berg was born of Jewish parents, he was not technically a practicing Jew and had claimed on air to have had doubts about the existence of a God. And we've talked about this already, hmm. that perception versus reality, if the order perceived Berg as Jewish and use this as a primary motive for their crime, then obviously it amounts to hate crime. So that's what I yeah, think happened, sure. right? I agree, yeah. The second, Berg's humiliating attack on Order member David Lane, live on air in 1984, may have played a larger role. But then, if we go back to what David Lane was saying about the Jewish community, it again makes sense to me that Berg's liberal views were also, or at least his attack was in response to anti-Semitic racist views of David Lane. Yeah. Right. So it just seems like a hate crime to me. Yeah, I think I'm exactly, I'm with you. I think we're, we're saying the same thing. I think that, yeah, there is a slight argument to be made that this was more revenge than it was a hate crime, but. Yeah, but revenge in the context of, again, you know, somebody spewing racist, bigoted, anti-Semitic views and exactly. then somebody responding to that, right? Totally, so totally at the agreed. end of the day, 
to me, it is a hate crime, whether yeah. we consider these factors or not. Yeah, I think you're right. And well said, as always. You say a lot better than I do. Mm, thank you, Asad. <laughs> <laughs> so, Asad, where are the order and its members today? Yeah, for the time being, it appears that the order is dissolved and largely neutralized. According to the Denver Post, in 2007, David Lane was found dead in his cell at a federal prison in Indiana. And then in 2010, just three years later, Bruce Pierce died of natural causes at his high security section of a correctional facility in Pennsylvania. So while these two people are no longer with us and it seems like the order has largely been neutralized or no longer with us, there is no doubt that white supremacists and neo-Nazi groups remain a dangerous threat to today's society. You're absolutely right, Asad. The neo-Nazi threat remains and in fact, a lot of white supremacist groups are alive and thriving. In 2018, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was attacked the shooter sought to target Hayes, a Jewish agency that works to help and resettle refugees. Unfortunately and tragically, 11 people were killed. You know what I said, the way I see it, there will always be hateful people in the world. But we can only hope that as time goes on, this percentage of people decreases. So Asad, tell me, how can listeners help? Listeners can help by supporting a bunch of nonprofit organizations that we will link in our show notes that seek to protect and further advance the rights of Jewish individuals. And some of those include organizations like Repair the World or the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. Again, we'll have links in the show notes to those organizations. Absolutely. Thank you to listeners for staying with us until the end. If you have any thoughts or additional information about this particular case, do share with us. If you want to learn more, check out links in the show notes about the case. Please email us your thoughts on this story or any other story that you think we should cover. You can reach us at info at invisiblehatepodcast.com. You can also tweet us or hit us up on Instagram. Just search for Invisible Heat Podcast. Don't forget to check out our new cover art. Would love to hear your thoughts. And if you have time and if you believe in the work that we are doing, write a nice review for us. Go to Apple <laughs> Podcasts or Spotify. It really makes our hearts melt. Thanks again for listening. Invisible Hate is a joint production of Rafaelion Media and Immigrantly. We'd like to thank our team, which includes Michaela Strather, Emmanuel Monaghan, and Paruma Chakravarti. Our music was done by Simon Hutchinson. We will be back, as always, with another hate crime for us to analyze. Until then, I'm Asad Bhatt. And I'm Sadia Khan. Invisible Hate.